Good morning. Today we're going to be looking at how we can navigate the ZOS um, TSO system. This is part of the IBM Master of the Mainframe contest. This right now is set for the 2018 contest, so you can see just the basics of how to do this, but this will work with any mainframe contest you're working on, or some of the basic use of how to use the ZOS slash TSO systems if you want to do some navigation within the enterprise computing systems. So first thing you have to do, of course, is log on. So log on in my username, and we get to the, the TSO logon screen. As you can see right here, I have a space for my password. I have a command section, and I want to make sure I look at reconnect. On the password section, of course, we just type in our password. It's really great. It's a tiny password. On the command section for log off, that means that as soon as I'm done, I automatically log off. When I exit my um, TSO system, it automatically logs me out of it. It's a nice way to make sure I'm just, oh, I disconnected my login properly. However, just in case something screws up or I um, do anything I do have happen with that, I automatically have it set to reconnect with the S right there in front of reconnect, which means, oh, I'm going to automatically reconnect to this when I try and log back in rather than being locked out of it because I'm in a uh, log in, log off state. That reconnect means it automatically allows me to get back into the system as long as I have the, cor the correct uh, user credentials. Now, if you notice down here in the bottom corner, we have this X system. That means the system itself is locked right now. I can't do any input. If I type any keys, it's just going to be unhappy with me. If I try and click, I get this um, no reaction to it. Ugh, no good. So if you see the X in the bottom left corner, that's a great indication that it's nothing to be going on right now. What we want to do is instead we want to make sure we wait until we see this lovely three stars right here. The three stars indicate that it is time right now to press enter. We can get past this. We're waiting for... Um, user interaction when we see the three dots. Now the color of the dots doesn't matter, or if I have more asterisks in a row, that's also great. But basically what we're seeing is as soon as we see the dots in a row, that's a clue for us, the user, that it's okay to proceed. So I press the enter key to proceed, and it brings me to the main menu. Now again, I have that X in the corner with a little clock saying, oh, it's gonna be a couple seconds, but here we are in the ISPF main options menu. So here in ISPF options, this is where we get um, most of the stuff we're working on, how we can get access to the different components of the screen. We're going to be looking at a couple different areas specifically for this. We're going to be looking at the um, utilities menu, which is where we do most of the work of the IBM Master Mainframe Challenge for part one and two. We're also going to look at SDSF, which is the output section, the Unix section, and the database in, uh, section. There, as you can see, there's a whole bunch of other places that we can go to um, access different components, but those are the three areas that we're going to be working with the most. To access anywhere within the system, we just type in the equal sign to go uh, to where we want to go. Equals basically brings us back to here, and then whatever we type in as an option will take us to that. So if I type in 3.4, that means I'm going to go to the 3 window, and then inside the 3 window, go to the 4 option. If I type in 4.5, I'm going to go to the 4 window, and then go to the 5 sub option. Okay, easy way to get around. But the main one we're going to do is 3.4. That takes us back to the scene. We're going to go to our DS listing. So I type in equals 3.4 brings me my data set list utility, aka this is where I'm going to find information where I can search for my different components. The main way we're going to be doing for data sets is going to be looking for DS names with our username. This is the stuff that belongs to us. So it's a great way to handle and get along, <clears throat> a great way to get involved with what we're working with. But we can also browse some other DS names. We'll talk about that in just a bit. But let's go take a look at the DS name level right now. So as you can see, I have all the files that belong to me and we're different data sets. Some of these are actual data files. Some of these are folders that have other files within them. And we can take a look at that by browsing through the information that goes along with it. And so we have the basic route right there. We have our um, ESDS, KSDS. These are some of the data sets for the different types of vSAM and non-vSAM data sets that you use for uh, different challenges and for doing other components. We also have our JCL folder. The JCL is short for job control language and that's where most of the challenges that we're working with in part two as well as what we work with inside part three reside. And we have our um, P2 output, which is where our stuff is entered. And the way we operate with this is I can go through and I can just use my cursor to scroll up and down. The arrow keys work really well for this. Also, I have the tab key, which taps me to uh, the next line, or shift tab, brings me back up a level. So tab and shift tab are great ways to get around inside this. I'm gonna go ahead and go down to the um, JCL section. I'm gonna use B to browse. That means me, that's gonna allow me to go inside and look and see inside this folder, because JCL is a um, partition data set which has members inside it. And so as you can see inside my JCL folder or partition data set, I have a whole bunch of different files of the JCL typer inside this that I can actually work with. So um, we would go ahead and look at one of these. If I click on that, I type in a B right here to browse that file. That's me so I can see what's inside it. So inside CH4 JCL, I have three programs that are being executed. Um, step one, step two, step three. Great, wonderful stuff. I'm gonna back out with command three. Command three backs me out so I can go to another part. So we can go back in through and browse through those different files, but we want to uh, take a look at some of the information with that. So let's go ahead and go back again with Command-3 to go back to our main um, DS list. And so this is what we're inside our actual folder. And we want to see what we can do to actually work with the data that goes inside this. And so what we're doing inside this is we're going to have to do some 
I'm working with data um, to actually do some manipulation, viewing, and looking at it. So to do so, I'm going to go to the uh, PDS data folder. So I'm going to go ahead and type in a B to browse that folder. So I'm going to edit the mix file so I can take a look at that because that's one uh, that gets used quite a bit inside this challenge in 2018. So E to edit. We'll go inside there. And we have inside our file, we have this lovely collection of eight lines where there's some information that's only visible on lines one, three, and eight that we can actually read. And the other lines are kind of, eh, eh, scoompify. In the mainframe system, we're using a different way of encoding the data. Mainframes are using the EBCDIC encoding, which is an older but still um, used way of looking at information. Well, um, systems we use on the in 21st century and late 20th century on a personal computer use the ASCII system for a lot of their data. And we can actually see how that looks. So I'm going to go ahead right here. This is EBCDIC. I can change it to ASCII version by going typing in source and space ASCII, the ASCII version. And now we can read lines 2, 4, 5, and 6. So we can actually get the information out of that. So there's different information here. And lines that were previously illegible are now piles of weird symbols that don't make any sense. We can see more of what's going on with that by looking at the hex values of this. We can see some of the differences of that. To do so, we type in hex space on, and that now turns each line into three different lines. And so we can see right here that the letter T is actually composed of the hex values 54. So 54 gives you a capital T, and a lowercase t is with um, 74. Oh, so there's a reference with that. So it's like that has that information. If I go back to the other version in EBCDIC mode, I type in the word reset, that'll take us to the EBCDIC so we can see what's happening in the EBCDIC land. And the capital T is E3. Oh, so the hex value for a capital T in ASCII is 54, but in EBCDIC, it's E3. So there's a definite difference between what's going on inside that. So we have a different way of looking at the information. So the information is viewable in one way, is not viewable the other way. So we have to actually take a look at that. On top of that, we have the way that we can actually go through, and if we um, type over this area, we can actually change the values that are inside this. So if I simply top on that top line, it'll on um, whatever I uh, type, will then get converted appropriately to the hex values that are below it. So if I change this um, capital T to E, and I'm right now, I'm inside um, EBCDIC mode, that will then change this to a different value. So if I type in save, as you can see, it changed that um, from capital, um, E3 to 85 for lowercase e. Oh, let's change that back to a capital T because that actually makes sense to what we want to do. So we'll hit save again. And now it's back to E3. So it actually makes sense what's going on with that. So we can make changes with that. Um, we can also do some really cool text manipulation. Sometimes we have to change lots of files, lots of information in that. So we have a command called change, which can change one thing at a time, or it can change everything. And all I have to do to do that is I type in change, the word I want to change, and what I want to change it to. So change DOS dis would look anywhere it would find the word DAS and change it to dis the first time it sees it. Now, I myself don't see DOS anywhere inside there. So if I press enter, no char is DOS found. So that doesn't do any good. However, if I change those right here, so change those, these, those changed. So it changed those to these. Oh. But I'm typing cancel because I don't want to actually do that. Because I don't want to destroy the data that I just made. So I'm going to hit cancel. And cancel is going to take me out back and not save the changes I made. So I'm going to go back inside that and I'm going to go view that by um, E to edit. Go back inside. And those who understand it, those who don't. So I didn't change that value because even though it was there, I hit cancel, it backed me out and didn't change it. So change and allows me to change individual values once or change all can change all the occurrences of that. And it is case sensitive. So if I typed in something that wasn't there, so I type in change all who and y three eight right to the D. Okay, who in caps isn't in here, but who lowercase is right there. So let's see what happens when I do that. Boom. Change who changed. Oh, it is not. It is case sensitive. E yikes. Okay, scratch that. It is case sen It is not case sensitive. So if I did that, it would change that. Ugh. So let's go cancel that for sure. Cancel. So the change all command, mm, not case sensitive. Get rid of that. Cancel. Go back inside here and E again. And there we have the who. Okay, so great. So the change command is not case sensitive. So we definitely want to make sure that we change that appropriately because otherwise that's a bad thing. So change is not case sensitive. It just goes through and changes the values of that. So we want to make sure we don't use the change command inappropriately when we're doing that. However, we also have inside here, we have some information that's stored in a different way. As you can see right here, we have the number 12018 positive. It takes six hexadecimal values, or six bytes to do that. So you have uh, 
Um, you have a, the F1, F2, F0, blah, 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 all that stuff to go there. But we can store that same number in what's called pack decimal. We can compress the value that we store for that by shrinking down in half. And it's only going to store three of them. So columns 1, 2, 3 have that value because it's 1, 2, 0, 1, 8, C has that same number but in half the space. Because in, when we're not storing it for human readable values, we can compress the information we're actually storing by that by cutting out how much it's legible. Because this value, 1, 2, 0, 1, 8, gives me this nothing, nothing, an I with a circumplex. Yeah. yeah, not very readable for humans. However, if I can, I can read that as a computer and actually parse that information, excuse me, I can read that as a computer and parse that and it takes up way less space. So it's a way we can compress information without sacrificing it or um, our, the, what we're doing for that. So we can do some cool stuff with compression on that. So that's a way we can do that. That's called pack decimal. So again, inside this file, we looked at how we could look at absidic, or <clears throat> inside this file, we looked at how we could sor look, store information both in absidic and ASCII format. So this is an EBCDIC right now, and so we can rewrite that. If I type it as source, source ASCII, and I'm not gonna read the ASCII text encoding, so I can read lines two, three, four, um, so two, four, five, and six. And if I reset it, go to um, EBCDIC mode, I can read lines one, three, and eight. So I can read information in different encodings, so I can store the same bits of information in different ways inside the file. So it's a great way I can have different layers of information, different encodings, and still store information across that. So I can read it in different types of machines. Really pretty cool. And so we also use the hex on and hex off so we can see the data that's hidden inside that, which is a great way to see what's stored inside pack decimal. Because if I turn hex off, I have no idea that there's anything in there that's legible. Inside, that's a, that weird L-ish I circumplex thing. That's not very helpful. And if I turn this to source ASCII, no, I can't even read that at all. I have no idea what's going on. So EBCDIC versus ASCII, and with packed decimal aren't legible. So I can compress information so I can make it even more helpful to store and use less storage space when storage actually matters. So that's what we can do for that one it is and that. Let's go take a look at another area right here. So we'll command three back out of that screen. Now inside this uh, data set, we can uh, create a brand new file. And I can do that um, by typing an S in the name of a new file name. So we'll call this sample. So S space sample and member not found, oh, that's because I'm browsing this. So I have to go Command-3 back out of here. So let's space that out. Command-3 lets me get out. And I'm going to go back. And instead of browsing that, I'm going to choose Edit That Folder. And I'm going to inside here. And I have there's clearly not anything called Sample. I'm going to do S space Sample. And because I'm editing the file, I can now create a file. And this is the ISPF editing tool. And so the ISPF editing tool works a little bit different than you do editing inside a PC or Mac. So right here, as you can see, I have this giant area that I can type in and edit, and I can write all this stuff I want. This is the entire text editing screen, area, everything from this column down and that row over. So I can go over here to this, and if I actually click right here and hit tab, you can see I can type in at this spot right there. That's okay to type. I can tab, 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 tab. And these are the lines that I have. However, when I'm using the ISPF editor, as soon as I press enter, when I'm done with this, watch what happens, boom. Bottom of data, all my blank lines I had nothing on there get collapsed up and they're shrunk away. And so it only has that information. However, I can add new lines again if I need to. So I can add lines in two different ways. I can type in I and add one line at a time right there. And here's a new line. And I press enter and there's another new line right there. And if I go down here to the bottom of this and I press enter, it stops it and it's done. I can also do right here, I can type in any of the command sections. I can type in I3. And that adds three new lines. And again, they're blank, but if I just simply press enter out of there, they go away, they're out of the way, they're gone, collapsed. So we wanna make sure that we don't use the enter key inappropriately. So this is where we see some differences in how we edit files on a PC versus the mainframe. And so we wanna actually plan for stuff. So if you uh, find you've made a change and you go back and do something again at the I and gives you a single value, puts one line right below it. If you do I and a number, I 30, Nine, that gives you 39 lines. But if you press enter, boom, all those blank lines go away. So it only adds, if you don't put anything in the line, it's blank, you press enter, it disappears, it's out of there. So you want, you want to make sure you actually use that appropriately. We can also do some really cool text manipulation. Um, we can do all the changes and stuff like that. So I can change right here. So I can do change all SD space cat. And now I've taken all my SDs and replaced them with cats. And as you can see, I have lines of change with that change arrow on the left hand, <clears throat> the change arrow on the left hand side for all the line numbers. Every time I saw SD, it made a change to that. Great, I'm gonna hit save and change all of that to there. So now it's saved and that's all right there. So it's good as soon as I exit that the cats, um, all the uh, SDs are now replaced with cat all the way through. 
So that's a great stuff right there. I can also delete lines. So I can delete one line at a time right here, type in D and hit enter. That will, um, maybe not. And so do save. Then it recognized. There we go. So I have to make sure if I'm doing that, I um, get rid of that change. So I'm just, uh, once I've done that right here, I hit save, enter. That takes care of all that. If I want to make any changes to this, like deleting line, I can type in D on that line number when it has a once it's been replaced with that instead of the CHG, which identifies it as a change. I can delete that line where cat is. If I want to delete this line as well where F cat is, I have to space that out so it's no longer saying change. Instead, I give it a value D right here, which will delete that. I can also space that out and type in D and a line number just like I did with I and a line number, and I can delete three lines. So D3 will delete three lines. Oh, cool. And then I have even more power. I can use the space space right there and type in dd and space that out and do dd and the dd command is delete everything from this spot to that spot inclusive so lines one two three and four are all going to go away when i press enter on this or there and all i have left is the cat so i can do a lot of commands by using the dd command so we have again to review we have the i command which will add a single line we have the i and a number which will add that many lines let's not do 234 Let's do I3. That adds three lines. I have the D command, which will delete one line, or press enter, it deletes all the blank lines. So if I add a I5 right here, add five lines, and I one, two, three, four, five. I press enter, there's all my five lines. Press enter again, closes it out. I can delete a single line with a D, which deletes one line. Great, one, two, three, four, five. Or I can type in D2 and delete two lines, including that line, one to five now. Or I can use the DD command, which delete those two lines inclusive. And all that's out of there. So I, D right there, as well as change, so we can do some stuff. That's a great way we can go through and do stuff. So we'll go ahead and we'll back out here one more time. And remember, command three always saves whatever you leave it at. So that's in there. So if I look at my sample, it just has that garbage. Now that file is not very helpful. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete that file. Now if I put my cursor right here on that blank line and press enter, it brings up the option, brings me right into that. If I command three back out though, if I type in sample and I type in a D on this line, I'm going to delete that file. Oh, yes, I want to. Sweet. Go ahead and delete that file. It's out of there. Now, even though it says sample right here, it has that prompt deleted. So if I type in refresh, that is no longer there. My sample file is completely gone. It doesn't exist at all anymore. So we learned how we can use the ISPF editor to add lines, remove lines, and remove groups of lines by using the II command. Or excuse me, remove groups of lines by using the DD command. So we've done some really cool manipulation of stuff with that. So on top of that, we also looked at how we could look at using the mix file. We looked at how we could look at hex on and hex off and look at the different encodings we have with EBCDIC and ASCII, as well as how we could store information with a packed decimal. Now, those are great, those are cool. However, let's go see what we can do to actually execute some programs. So we're gonna go back out of here. I'm gonna do command three to back out. Remember, command three always backs me out. I'm gonna go to the JCL folder, which is where all the code happens. I'm gonna go ahead and, and browse that folder. And even though I'm not gonna make changes to this one, I, I can go browse and I can run commands through this. And JCL is a job control language. It's where the things you actually run. You'll see this in a lot of different things inside the different challenges on Master of the Mainframe. I'm gonna go ahead and here go to challenge 10 from 2018. I'm gonna to go to E to edit that file so it pulls it up. And as you can see right here, I have a whole bunch of different values inside my challenge 10 that are going along with that. And with the challenge 10, this is gonna go through, it's gonna um, uh, reproduce some files from input and put it into an out file, either seek, PDS, PDSE, KSDS, ESDS, or RDS, which you can find out what those belong to and the types of different data sets that are attached to that, and then some different commands. And so we have the job right here is called ch um, challenge 10 JCL. It's gonna do the ID camps program to execute copy, and then it's gonna execute the program age certificate 01 and call that result. And if RC is zero, then it's gonna end if. So we have some different things that are happening inside that. Now, if I, right now I have the JCL highlighting on so I can see easily what's going on with that. Um, this column right here is the DD name column. This is where a lot of the work happens. Is that a question? question. Oh, it's okay. And so this is the DD name column. This is where we um, give the command names for things that are gonna happen. And then the DD uh, pr protocol that goes attach that and the files that then are linked to that and what is going on with them. And that's something you'll look at more often, but this is just a quick little overview. So you can find some more stuff about that later. But to submit a file, I have a couple different ways I can do that. I can type in the word submit, all one word, Okay, that's great. And I'll just ex submit this job to be ran, and I press enter. Okay, the job is submitted. Again, we have that three dots down here at the bottom, and I press enter again, which means it's waiting for me to do something. And, okay, great. So what happens? Ow. But 
that I don't know if that job was successful, if there was an error or anything like that. So I can go ahead and hit Command-3 to get back out of here. Oh, here's a new message. It ended, and there's a max CC0. So this max CC0 part right here is generally the nice little message saying, hey, I ended correctly. If you have an error message after the max CC, usually that means there's a problem with that. But the way we find that is we have to actually go back and look into a different system. And so let's actually take a look at how we can go to a new system. So again, we have the three dots, which means we press the Enter key. So I press Enter. And we're going to go and we're going to use the um, go to the SDSF menu and check that. Now I could go back to the main menu and go to SD and then go to the status menu and go from there. But I'm going to do a shortcut and do equals and then SD.ST, which means I'm going to go back to main menu with the equals sign. Have a great holiday. So equals sign takes me back to the main menu. SD takes me to the SDSF menu. And then dot takes me to this, um, dot ST takes me to the status screen. So boom, I go here. And here I have the jobs that I've ran recently. As you can see, I have the most recent job down here at the bottom. In this case, it's CH10JCL. And inside the status screen, there's, we want to actually see what's going on inside that. To do so, I go over here in the NP column, and I type in a question mark to question the file. And I'll look inside it. And I look inside that, I have all the DD names that are attached to that. And so inside this, I have the DD names of Jess message, Jess JCL, Jesse message, sysprint, and sysprint. And so this is where I can see what's going on inside that. And so if there's an error, usually the error is going to hide right here inside the Jesse message. And to look inside that, I type in an S to examine that. And this tells me, oh, here's what happened. I can page down through this using Command-8 to page down. And I can see right here there's no obvious errors or anything happening because I've actually done this and worked properly, which is great. So I go back up here, and it's all right there. It does the information. It ran and executed properly. Again, Command-3 backs me back out. I can go look at the next one right here, and I hit S on sysprint. And I can, oh, here's this, it, it executed properly, code is zero, code is zero, code is zero. Oh, great, that all works. So that's a nice little message for me that it all worked for there. Again, command three to back out. And my result command, which is that second one that we did, and I do S to look inside the result. And here is the what happens for the result when I executed that program. And I can page down through all of that, seeing all the stuff that I printed to my file as part of the end of the program. So that worked perfectly, wonderful. If there's an error, however, it would be doing something different. And so I can make that happen and by looking at that and doing some other things. But that's a, uh, part of the challenge of actually going through and working through the master mainframe. So we'll let you do that later. But again, to get to this, I just do Command-3, uh, Command-3, Command-3, and I, oh, I'm back at the ISPF menu. So again, to do that, I could just type in SD right here. It takes me to that system. And I have this giant pile of stuff, and I want to go to the status of jobs, because this is the SDF uh, system, and I choose ST from here, instead of doing equals SD.ST. So I'm going to go back out of here, go back to the main menu, I do all the work, so I do um, equals and 3.4, which takes me to my job area. Again, confirming I want to go to my DS name level, where my stuff is, and I can go through and look in that. And so this is, again, where I do all of my stuff I'm working on. Now, we've looked at how we could do editing files, how we could add files. We can also go back into that JCL section. I'm going to go ahead and browse right here. And we can do another way of submitting this. So I'm going to go inside here. I'm going to go back into 11 this time. I'm going to go to E to edit. And I have that same file. This one's a little bit smaller. And I can submit a file by also typing in sub. So it's a quick short way to do that. And I'll do the same thing for submitting the file. So I can type in the word submit, or I can type in sub, or guess what else? Command three, back right back out of here. I can go to the right here and type in sub right here. If I already know it's already perfect, I can hit submit from this and it'll execute it right there. Boom, job submitted, press enter, and it's done. So I have that that I can do right there. So that's a great way I can move around. Now, there's a couple other areas we have to look at as well. So let's go ahead and back out again. So I'm gonna go um, just do equals and take me to the main menu. Job ended successfully, max level four, okay. So equals, oh, that doesn't work. So I have to invalid command on its own. So I'm gonna just do command three to back out, back out, back out. And I'm back in the main menu. So we've looked at the 3.4, we do the utilities on there. We've looked at SDSF where we can see the status of our jobs. We wanna look at Unix now. So I can access the Unix systems attached to this TSO environment by typing in equals U. It brings me the um, Unix system. So here I can run all my regular Unix commands that are attached to a regular, very basic Unix system. So I don't have an X Windows, obviously, so I'm not going to do any GUI components in here. But I can run ls. And here's the files that are listed inside. I can do ls space dash a to list all the files, including hidden locations. And boom, there's the .sh history for the hidden location. And the, um, you see my directories. I can type in uh, cd space dot dot. I can go back a level. And I can ls right here. And look, there's all the files that exist inside that directory. Oh boy, lots of stuff. Ah, hmm. Oh dear, that takes time. So as that's running, we can let that wait. And I'm gonna type in the word exit. So when this is done, I'm going to exit out of here and get out of Linux, because I don't need to run through all their systems.
And so when I typed in exit automatically, as soon as it finished, it brought me to that. So I press enter to exit that. I can get out of the OMBS. Brings me right back here. I can also type in TSO OMBS. And it brings me to the same spot as well. So I can either equals U or TSO OMBS. And to get out of here, all I have to type to do is type in exit. That sends that from here to the terminal, brings me right back out, says it's entered, press enter to get back out of here. So either equals U or TSO OMBS, either one get me into Linux so I can actually get access to Unix uh, prompt and do all the stuff in there. The next thing I want to look at is the database section. So I type in D2 to go to database land, because that's what we have right here for database, and D2. And we do our, um, <clears throat> in database land, most of the stuff we'll be working with this is just working with inside Spoofy to do our SQL statements. So I just type in one to go to Spoofy. Now, of course, I've already had to make some settings on that. The settings you need to make for that um, already have to be handled before you do this, so that would depend on the contest or what you're doing inside there, so I'm not going to that today. But we want to make sure we have a data set name attached to this. In this case, my data set I'm working with is inside pds.data in the SQL data member, and all my output's going to go to my SQL.out file. And that must be, as it says, a sequential data set, aka a specific data file, because sequential data set is one single file. So I go ahead and press Enter to go inside here, and it says, hey, this could corrupt if you don't do anything right. Okay, great, that's no big deal. Okay. Terminator is automatically a semicolon, great. Max line's 250, no worries. And it has the information, it's already pre-specified. So generally this is what is defaults, good to go. Press enter again one more time. And here we can write any um, basic SQL command. So I have right here, I have select phono from IBM user.emp where last name is Yamamoto, which is one of the things I have to actually find out to get some information from that. Now, once I've got this in here, I make any changes to this, I can comment stuff out right here. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna comment out this line. I'm gonna go up here and use my F keys thing so I can do some more with this. My F keys allows me to actually go through and make some uh, things that I don't have access to because I only have, I can only do command in single digits, but I have right here insert mode. And so insert mode lets me so I can go over and actually insert inside the text. F10 lets me go um, left and F11 lets me go right to scroll. So if I go command right, oh, I can scroll over and see what's inside that one. Ooh, cool. I'm gonna go back to F keys right here, go back to PF10. Let's go back to the left. Hey, I can scroll back over. It doesn't change anything. It's just like going to the other side of the screen. What I'm gonna do right here though, however, is I'm gonna go on this line right here put my cursor on this, go to my F keys, go to insert mode, and I'm gonna add a dash dash, and look, it didn't overtype like it has been earlier. So I can actually go through and just comment that line out by entering a dash dash to comment that line out. Now, when I hit enter, enter again, I'm just at end of data, enter, okay. This doesn't do much, this is kind of boring. No, to, once I'm done with this, I do command three to back out. It's gonna process all those um, sessions. It's like, okay, verifying again, where do you want this to go? It's coming from SQL data. And I want to put this to sql.out, press enter one more time. And here's the result from that last um, that query. Oh, bonus from IBM user is a $500 bonus. Great, so it, run, it executes that statement and returns the value right here. So if I delete all those lines, it just give me only this value right here as bonus. But that's the way I can get out of this. I press enter. Oh, nothing again, because it doesn't do anything. But again, how do I get back out? That's right, command three backs me out. Okay, and so I back out right here. I can do any spot right here. I can type in equals 3.4 take me back to the menu I want to go to. Anytime I see that command, oh, I'm in spooky, I can't get out right here, so I have to pass that out. So command three to back out of this window, but I'm now back inside this. So at these other functions right here, I can't use equals 3.4. Only inside anywhere in the ISPF structure can I use the equals 3.4 to go back to my main menu. So command three always backs me out, but I can always get um, back out and around from through that. Okay. Womp, womp. List of instructions. Okay. We did those. We did that. I think we did that. We did that. Oh. Forgot one thing. We're in the SDF, um, SDSF menu. If we want to um, copy files to something, so let's go ahead and do that. We're going to go to sd.st. So I'm going to go back inside this. I'm going to tab down here to my ch10. I want to look inside it again with a question mark. And say I want to get some information transferred from here to somewhere else. The command I use right here is I type in XDC. And XDC will allow me to transfer information to a new thing. So I'm gonna uh, print that data set to this new spot. And so I can tell this right here, I'm gonna print this to the output folder. I'm gonna put this as a new number. The name to use is hashtag 999. And this is the unit I say char. So I'm gonna go ahead and press enter on that. It's gonna write that file to there. I'm gonna check that out and type in equals 3.4. Takes me back to this menu. I'm gonna go back down to my PDS um, P2 of output data set. And browse that one and I have that 999 that I just wrote right here, and I can browse that and take a look at it. And there's the stuff that I got from the uh, challenge 10, the information. So I'm gonna command three to back out. And because that I don't need that, I'm gonna type in refresh and enter. And I'm gonna delete this file again by typing in D and pressing enter. 
I delete that file, it's okay, good, get rid of it, we're good to go. So I've gotten that right there, backed out, created that file, and we've demonstrated how we can do a bunch of different things using the master mainframe environment. We learned how to browse and go through information by using the uh, command three to back out of Windows, uh, equals 3.4 to go back to the uh, route we need to go to. We do have to do one more thing though, browse other data sets. So I wanna go ahead and grab another data set. So I'm gonna do a command three to back out to this room. And I wanna look inside Linux and look inside my Linux section. So I type in slash Z slash my Z number, Z0970. And now I can actually browse the directory that's my Linux folder, but using the regular system right here. I can also browse directories that aren't mine by looking through this. So I can go back out of here, command three, back out. And this time I wanna browse the, um, the Linux system. I wanna browse files that are part of the actual project. So I can type in zos.mtm2018. And I'm gonna go look inside, oh, here's all those, the folders inside the MTM2018 public directory. So I can look at all the stuff that's inside this. So I can see all the cool data that's available throughout the entire project. And so I can go click right here. I can go to my hunt2 folder. I can browse that. And inside here, oh, there's a file inside there. Cool, nifty. I can browse through the public information that's available to that. So I can actually look inside other areas as well. So I can do that by going over here and changing what my DS name of what I'm browsing through. So I can browse through Linux files, I can browse through other parts of the mainframe, I can browse my own files, and that's all available right here inside the DS name level. But generally you wanna use this for your DS level. And again, spaces take everything out. Boom, I'm back to where I can see everything I need for this, and I can see all my cool stuff that I've made. So I've got some really cool stuff I've made for this, and we've learned how to do a couple different things, including how to browse through files, edit files, do ISPF editing, and do some cool stuff. Hopefully this will help you understand how to do master mainframe and do some practice with that for next year. Have a great day, thanks.